Well, it is seven o'clock, so we'll go ahead and get started. And if others join in, that's great. We had a ton of people register for this evening's um, advanced session of our first virtual insect spectacular. We're super excited to be here tonight. Um, we wish we could be together in person, but for the health and safety of, of everybody, um, this, this is a much safer option this year. So um, a couple of ground rules, if you would. I, some of you uh, were on Monday evening as well. You look familiar. Um, but just to make sure everybody's um, familiar with Zoom, if you would, find your reaction button and give everybody um, a, a welcome clap. Oh, good. Okay. Now, to make sure your chat box is working, if you could um, tell us what county or district you are a 4-H member of and type that into the chat box and maybe tell us one thing you're hoping to learn on tonight's webinar. Good, Greenwood County and Johnson County. And if you can think of something that you're hoping to learn, or maybe you have a specific question that you want us to cover. Scott County. How many out of staters tonight? Is everybody able to find their chat box? Oh, good. Marshall County, Illinois. Well, welcome. Um, Jefferson County. Very good. Crawford County. You're hoping to learn how to pin a grasshopper. Uh, tips and tricks uh, to identification. Hi, Garrett from Morton County. Excellent. Okay. Well, good. If, uh, you, if you don't feel like unmuting yourself and sort of interrupting as we go along, please um, feel free to uh, write any chat or any questions or comments uh, in the chat box. And I will make it um, my responsibility to sort of keep an eye on the chat box so we don't miss any, anything. Um, like I mentioned earlier, uh, normally we'd be together in person and uh, I just want to give a, a quick shout out to some of the volunteers that are on tonight. Uh, Vicki Wallace and David Williams, as well as Isaac Fox. Um, Shannon Rogie isn't a volunteer, but she's one of our, um, on our State 4-H staff. And so they have spent considerable hours and months planning uh, the webinars this week. And so I want to thank them for their time and efforts into making this a success. So thank you very much. Um, we have two presenters, special presenters with us this evening. Um, they, they go above and beyond to help us out and, and have judged at the Kansas State Fair multiple years and they've uh, came and presented at other insect spectaculars. We're really glad to have them back. They're both uh, graduate students at Kansas State University in entomology. So welcome Matt Hamblin and Jacqueline, is it Maley? I'm never sure if I pronounce it right. Mail? It's Maley. You had it right the first time. Okay. okay. <laughs> Very good. Well, welcome to you both. Um, and with that, I'm going to turn it over to you. Okay. Um, well, like, uh, like Amy said, I'm Matt Hamblin. Um, and we'll just go ahead and kind of jump in. We'll tell you a little bit about ourselves. Um, and then I guess dive right into to what we're doing. Um, so I am a master's student at K-State. Um, I actually just finished up classes, so I'm just down to writing my thesis and I'm done. Um, so great big accomplishment there. Uh, I did get my undergrad from K-State as well. I got a minor in entomology and uh, dual majored in biology um, in the spring of 2018 and then just stuck around for my master's. Um, if anybody knows Sarah Zuckoff out at um, the Research and Extension Center in Garden City, she is my advisor. 
Uh, so I work with her and I am um, trying to understand how farmers and other agribusiness professionals um, make decisions on what insecticides they're using um, in their fields, on their crops, how they're making those decisions, who's helping them make them, um, and then really knowing what they're doing so that I can help develop education programs so that they can make more educated decisions and not spray if they don't need to or make sure they're using the right insecticides. Because um, if they're treating for one pest but their neighbor has a completely different crop, the pests don't generally overlap and, and sometimes we see a lot of, of misusage for insecticides. So that's me and that's what I do. I'm Jacqueline Maley. Um, I just started my PhD at Kansas State University and I just finished my master's in entomology in stored products uh, last December and it seems like a long time ago but I also graduated from Austin Peay State University. I got a um, bachelor's of science in biology and I minored in chemistry and um, with my PhD I'm working in conjunction with the USDA uh, Ciro unit, and so that stands for Stored Product Insects and Engineering Research Unit here in Manhattan. And I'm focusing on uh, stored product pest sensory systems and management. So I'm really excited to start my PhD, and I'm really excited and passionate about outreach. So that's kind of why I'm here. It has nothing to do with the fact that I suckered you into it. No. <laughs> but I like it. Uh, well, uh, hi, I'm Isaac Fox. Uh, this is my last year in 4-H. I haven't gotten to college yet. Um, I was the 2016 Kansas 4-H Entomology Award winner, and I am currently a pest scout at Arles Greenhouse at Leroy, Kansas. All right, um, so I guess I'll just start off. We didn't plan super well, so there's just gonna be a lot of trade-off uh, for, for people talking about stuff. Um, so tonight we're gonna be talking about beetles. Um, as many of you are aware, beetles are the most abundant uh, and diverse group of animals in the world. Um, insects rank number one worldwide as a whole, but within that beetles outnumber everything else. Um, by almost a factor of three. So if you lined up one representative of every species of animal in the world, um, about every third one would be a beetle. Um, about every other third one would be a wasp um, or an ant or something of that nature, one of the hymenopterans. But generally, most of them are going to be beetles. Um, so they're just massive, massive numbers, huge amount of diversity, um, almost 400,000 species worldwide. Um, and in total life forms, just uh, like that slide says, about 25%, that they are everywhere on the planet. Um, they have evolved in some miraculous ways that give them access to uh, many, many different um, habitats. Uh, they've taken advantage of every single little niche that is out there. Um, so beetles, I think they're, they're super cool. I, I think they're amazing. They're really my really my second favorite group. I'm, I'm a left guy, so um, I like charismatic megafauna, but that's just me. Um, so what really makes a beetle? Um, the, the big things is they have that complete life cycle. They are the, the first group that really does that effectively. Um, so you have eggs, you have your, your grubs or your instars, um, and then they do pupate and then spend some time in that pupil form uh, before becoming an adult. Uh, they do have two fully functioning sets of wings. Um, the elytra are the outer wings. They are hardened, they're thicker, um, not necessarily used for flying um, most of the time, but they kind of stick out funny when, when they're flying. Um, but then most beetles do have a functioning set of wings that are tucked underneath those elytra. They keep them folded up real nicely. Um, in relation to the body, their mandibles move horizontally, so they, they go this direction. They don't do this number. They don't move like our mouths do. Um, and then their antennae. Uh, if you're looking at, you're going to see a lot of antennae talk tonight, and 
I apologize for that, but it's it's kind of required. Um, they they have segments in their antennae called antenna mirrors, uh, which if you are looking at your handout, you'll see I reference in there a lot, pretty much I think everywhere. Um, I call them antenna mirrors, and you really have to count those in a lot of cases. Um, Eleven or less is pretty standard, um, but the cerambicids and the ripocerids, so the longhorn beetles and uh, the ripocerids are the um, cicada wedge beetles. Would you say? Or wedge-shaped beetles? Or are they the wedge-shaped? Um, but those guys, they have a few different numbers. So um, 11 or less is usually where, uh, where you need to be for that. So those are something you want to, want to count out um, if you're looking at them under a scope. And then because they do have that complete life cycle, they are full of metabolites. Uh, so some of the things we're going to talk about in the identification uh, with the beetles, because this is really like the nitty gritty um, and the things you really have to look at. Um, the, the tarsi are unfortunately super important in a lot of cases um, and unfortunately can be really hard to see. Um, so some beetles have, the, the basic body plan of the beetles is they have five tarsal segments, um, but some of those segments are super tiny and it's really hard to see even with a scope. Um, but in, in most cases, you will see that beetles have a, a five, five, four tarsal segment being front, middle, and hind legs. Uh, but that is not always the case. I did indicate that in, in the handout. Um, but you do have to look at those a lot. You have to look at spurs or spines on the tarsi, placement and features of the antennae, um, features on the elytra, the way the eyes are positioned, the way the eyes are shaped, and then kind of general body form. Are they long? Are they flat? Are they round? Are they like short? Are they chunky? Like what, what kind of shape is that body? Um, and how does it, how does it play out? Because a lot of beetles are kind of kind of oval and kind of flat, but kind of round and kind of oblong. Um, so they kind of, a lot of families cross that gambit of, they look like a lot of other things. Uh, so lots of features to look at when it comes to the beetles. Uh, Jackie, do you want to talk antennae? Sure. Um, so I am. <laughs> there are obviously, um, quite a bit of diversity in antennae. And this is because um, antennae help an insect sense the world around them. So um, I listed the main ones uh, that you will see over all insects. Um, however, um, you typically will see all of these forms except plumos. Uh, plumos antennae are typically found in uh, Lepidoptera or in Diptera. So we will see filiform, which is thread-like, and maniliform, which looks like little beads. And then serrate looks like sawtooth. It's almost like it's coming into one another. Um, it might be difficult to see uh, from this image. There's cetaceous, which looks like um, bristles. And we do see that in some of our um, carabids, which are gonna be our ground beetles. Um, we see lamellate which is called a nested plate and it kind of um unless they fan them out which they do this typically to find mates we don't always see them all to, uh, fanned out completely they'll kind of keep them together as a plate um, however if the beetle is alive and active and you can see it kind of moving around it will do this um, behavior especially at night if you're looking uh, near lights um, we see pectinate, which is looking like a comb. Um, we will also see clavate, which is a generally clubbed antenna, but we more see uh, cap uh, capitate, which is a very, it looks almost maniliform, and then it has a little club right at the end. So it's not really pictured here, but we will see it in some of our examples tonight. And then um, aristate, that's another one we will not see um, tonight. That is typically for diptera, that's in the flies, more of the modern flies, um, like blowflies and stuff like that. And that's kind of like a little pouch with a little bristle. So um, 
we will see many of these tonight. And if there are any that uh, you might get confused over when we're going through a presentation, just uh, give us a question about it and we'll answer that, okay? So I wanted to talk about this species in particular because it's important to us here in Kansas. And this is Necrophilus americanus, and it's in the family Sylphidae, and this is the American bearing beetle. And the reason why I mention this is because it's an endangered species, and it's been on the endangered species list since the early 90s. And so um, you cannot collect these. However, if you see them, um, you will need to contact the Ecological Service section in Kansas, and that's with the Wildlife Parks and Tourism. So you can report that they're in a certain area, and this way that area can be possibly conserved. These sylphids are easy to recognize. Um, we will go over sylphids tonight, but um, they're very distinct with this red-tipped antenna. Um, as you can see, the clubs are red-tipped. And then they also um, have a red pronotum. So the pronotum is the part right behind their head. It's almost like their shoulders. There's a red section and it's outlined by black. The county is where there's critical habitats that are um, already protected are Montgomery County, Elk County, Chautauqua County, and Wilson County here in Kansas. So be aware of that. Um, they're, they used to have a very large range, but um, they have um, now been reduced to only a few counties in Kansas and in Oklahoma and Nebraska. So just be aware of those and make sure you do not collect them because uh, you can be fined if you found out. So uh, try to let them uh, be them, but also if you come across them, don't collect them and report them in the area. Also, fun fact, I just learned this week, uh, the St. Louis Zoo is actually doing a breeding and release program uh, with the American Bearing Beetles. They released 88 beetles this week, I believe it was. Um, they, they set up 44 pairs that they took to uh, Southern Missouri to release. Awesome. Um, also, to mention the male and females distinguishable by the amount of red near their mandibles. Um, so the female has a small triangle and the male has a larger uh, triangle uh, that's more rounded. So that's just kind of a fun fact. So um, I guess we can start by getting into the suborders and this is really important because it'll help you start breaking out the different families a little better. So there are two suborders, it's Adifaga and Polyphaga. And Adifaga is much smaller than Polyphaga. However, um, Adifaga is older in many cases. So Adifaga is going to have ab the first two abdominal segments um, are going to be uh, separated by a plate in the middle and their coxa. And then Polyphaga will not have any separation. So as you can see, the image that has the blue, um, well, the pink around the top of the uh, thorax, that is the suborder Adifaga. And then the uh, suborder Polyphaga does not have that pink around it. So it's also labeled there, and this is on the, the ventral view or the, um, the like stomach view. So uh, this will help you start figuring out which uh, families they might be in, and this is uh, the first step to start IDing your insects or your beetles particularly. Um, so on that note, how many of you guys are familiar with using a dichotomous key? Um, have you Raise guys your hand. looked at a key, kind of, maybe sort of? Um, so basically, a, a dichotomous key, this is one of those things, beetles are so diverse, um, it, and a lot of them are, are very, very similar. Um, a dichotomous key really helps you with that. And um, it's, it's basically a series of yes or no questions. Um, we've all seen like the choose your own adventure books it's kind of the same thing. It, it says, you know, does this beetle have this or does it have, does it not have that? 
Um, and then, so you go, yes, it has this particular feature and it'll go, okay, continue to step, you know, number two. And if you say, no, it does not, it might jump you to step number 15. Um, and so, especially in the Beatles, because it is such a, a massive, massive group, there's, um, I don't think we hit the slide, um, but there's, you know, 115 families in the United States. We have 80 different families in Kansas. Um, it can be really hard to identify a lot of little black beetles because there's a lot of little black beetles. Um, and, and this is going to be a case where I personally am going to advocate hugely for you working with a dichotomous key. I actually have one. Um, this is my favorite beetle book of all time. Uh, it's Beetles of Eastern um, North America. Uh, this is everything, uh, the author did everything east of the Rocky Mountains, um, and it has a key in it. So the keys are always, they have pictures, they're illustrated, um, it gives you all of the definitions for things that you're looking at. Um, and Taylor, to answer your question, it so like this book has its own key in it. You can buy keys for just different things. You can get keys just for aquatics, you can get keys for butterflies. Um, it's, it's all just a, a commitment of what you're interested in. Um, this book runs about $25 on Amazon. I looked at it earlier. Uh, but with identifying beetles, it's super important because you are going to have to get into actually looking at a bunch of these super tiny uh, little features. And so when we're going through this, this is we're pulling things out of uh, the keys that are important for you to actually look at to be able to identify stuff. We also included a free key from the University of Florida Extension, and it does cover um, a lot of these major families that we're covering today. There are some that are a few absent, but the same features, um, that's why it's a family characteristic. So um, even though we're here in Kansas or you might be in Illinois, those features are still the same to identify those families. So it will still work for those families. Absolutely. Uh, so this is the slide I was actually just in reference to. Um, so like I said, there's, there's about 176 described families in the United States. Um, there's a handful that are exclusive to California. There's a handful that are exclusive to like Florida. Um, but we have about 115 in the Eastern United States. So again, east of the Rocky Mountains. Um, and about 80 of those uh, we see here in Kansas. So there is a lot of diversity. Um, just like glancing at this image, I'm ticking off, you know, I think almost every single one of these is a different family. Um, this bottom row down here, there's, there's three scarabs right there in a row, but uh, there's at least 10 or 15 families just listed on, on this image by itself. And you know, if you're just looking at it, you see a lot of little black beetles. You see a lot of kind of red and black beetles. Um, but, you know, you see these little red and black beetles like this ladybug here in the middle, but then you have um, a different red and black beetle over here that's a longhorn. So it's, you can't necessarily go by colors or patterns or things like that because there's just a lot of overlap um, in those families. So again, that's where you push the keys. Okay, do you want a shot at it, Isaac, or do you want us to continue? Uh, you can keep on going with that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, uh, um, I just want to show you uh, there a difficult, this is a better image and it shows you that those first two segments of the abdomen and um, the segments are sometimes called sternites, so you might see that on your handout. It's separated by the coxa. The coxa is outlined in green, and this is um, one of the leg same segments, first leg segments. Um, if you were to list out the leg segments from the body to uh, the, you know, ground or to the tibia, so. Um, I just want to make sure that you guys can really tell exactly where I'm talking about because this is going to become important. We're only going to go over, I think, six families in a diffiga. A diffiga is much smaller. 
Um, but there are some families that might get a little confusing um, if you can't tell the features apart. So, and some of them do look like polyphaga. So if you're ever a little confused, start right there with figuring out if it's a diphaga or polyphaga of the suborders. And that can help give you an idea of what you might be looking at. Okay, so first we have the ever-loving ground beetle. And the ground beetle is in the family Carabidae. And these guys are diverse. So they have um, lots of, they come in many different antenna forms. So we see the cetaceous, the filiform, the maniliform, serrate. And they also have crazy different body forms. So, um, they can be very small and oblong. They can be kind of broad with a smaller head and a smaller thorax, or they can be kind of thick all the way through. So um, if you guys can see just the face of the one insect, that's a tiger beetle. And then um, the beetle with the green elytra, that is a caterpillar hunter. And then we also have um, a ground beetle um, on the bottom. I'm not, I don't remember what the common name of that is. However, it gets mistaken a lot for another family that we'll discuss soon. Um, and so these are variable also in size. They can be very, very small, 0.7 millimeters long, all the way up to 66 millimeters long. So a lot of times you can see these guys walking around on the ground. They'll be in sandy soils or on pavement. And they also come to lights at night. So those are kind of ways that you can find them and um, look at them and identify them. And then you've got Gyrinidae, and these are called whirligig beetles. And they're some of my favorites. They look like sunflower seeds whirling around on the surfaces of water. You'll usually find these on slow moving waters in rivers or in ponds and lakes. So they have an elliptical body and the key feature for these guys is that their eyes are split into a dorsal and ventral view. So a top eye and a bottom eye and they're completely separated by their, um, oh goodness, uh, their, their body basically. And um, yeah, you can also find them in creeks if the creek is kind of slow moving. So. Uh, Basically any water, you could potentially see them whirling around on the surface of the water. And they're uh, what's called gregarious, so they'll typically be in bigger groups. And this is to make sure that they scare off fish. And they are anywhere between three and 18 millimeters. There's quite a lot of, um, they all look pretty similar, um, but there's actually many species of them in North America, interestingly enough. Next. All right, these two guys also get mistaken a lot of times. So we have Ditiscidae and they are uh, the predaceous diving beetles. And they, as you can see um, on their middle, they have no spine there. So between the second legs and the third le pair of legs, there's no spine. And they'll be an elliptical body form and they have uh, what's called filiform antenna, and they're actually quite long, the antenna are. And they're gonna be between 0.7 and 66 millimeters, and they are typically brown or black, and they're very shiny. And um, they will be at the bottom of uh, waters. Normally, they're not very fast moving waters, and you can get them with a aquatic net or like an aquarium net digging kind of down near vegetation. That's where you guys can get those. Um, I have seen some fly to lights at night, but not as much as um, hydrophilidae, which are the water scavenger beetles. And so the water scavenger beetles, they will have that ventral spine between the second and third pair of legs, and they still have an elliptical body form. And they are black and shiny, so this is why these two get confused a lot typically, but look for that spine, it's really going to help you out. Also, you can see in the one image, it looks like this uh, hydrophilid has long antenna. However, those are the mouth parts. And um, so they actually have short clubbed antenna, and typically it's harder to see this unless you have a microscope or a hand lens. And um, they're a little larger. Um, 
to start out with, but they don't range as large. So it's 1.2 to 40 millimeters long. So definitely look for the ventral spine if you see that this is a, an adifaga black elliptical beetle and just flip it over, look for that spine. It'll really tell you between these two families. Um, can you guys see my mouse where I'm like circling around this? Uh, this is the spine right here. I'm just trying to help point it out because I know where Jackie's talking about. So it's, and since I'm driving, um, I'm going to try to point things out where, where I can to help you guys see some of that stuff. I just want to make sure I wasn't doing it for me. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we've got some more aquatic beetles here. And if you can't tell, aquatics are one of my favorites. Um, so we have two more. This is Holipidae, and they are oval and convex. So that means they're kind of bulged. And they typically have dark patches or spots on their elytra. And their key characteristic is that they have a hind coxal plate. And so um, if you go to the third pair of legs, and this is kind of hard to see on this image, uh, when it's on its ventral side, they are cut, there's, there's a coxal plate that goes over them. And it's very um, easy to tell uh, when you have a very nice close-up image and the legs almost come out to the sides a little bit um, and there's like a groove. So this is a good way to tell um, what those are and they're 1.5 to 5 millimeters long so they're very small and typically you'll find these towards the edges of the water near the sand. They usually swim around pretty quickly. Um, you can also find them in ditches or creeks and uh, they do like um, not super clean water, but they do like pretty good quality water. So um, that's where you'll find them. Then we have Noteridae. They have a very uh, distinct feature and this is a platform underneath um, uh, on their ventral side. It will form a plate between the second and third pair of legs. So Polypidae is on the third pair of legs and then Noteridae is between the second and third. So there's this very distinct plate and they are more elliptical uh, in body. It kind of looks like a bullet speeding through the water actually. And I've found these guys um, in more, fa like in a little bit quicker moving waters, um, but you can find them near the vegetation of that area. And they're normally about one to five millimeters long I think they're really cute and they also are normally colored with a dark to light color um, coloration on them. So it's not uncommon to see uh, their elytra be darker than their thorax or their heads or um, have some kind of mix of coloration there. So if you guys want to respond in the chat, um, one, two, and three. Can you tell me which is not in the suborder Adifaga? So um, let's do. Left to right. Yeah, left to right. One, two, and three. Okay, so remember a diffiga means that the segments are split. So if we're going from left to right, number one does not have its segments split. I know it's kind of hard to tell. 
So the segment actually starts below the coxa. And so you might have to, when you have your specimen, uh, you might have to lift it up where number two is a carabid and it is split. You can see those coxa are very close together and those segments are splitting those segment or the cocks are splitting the segments. And number three also, it, it's kind of difficult to tell, but that's first segment there that Matt's highlighting. And then the third segment, or sorry, the first and second segment there, and it's split by those coxa. And so sometimes this is a difficult trait to tell if you um, just are not used to it. So basically the, the big key here is if you can if you can run your like your pointer or uh, like I'm doing with my mouse, uh, if you can start at one side of your beetle and you can go all the way across without hitting the legs um, where like they actually cross over that line, um, that's how you can tell the difference between a defaga and polyphaga is because I'm gonna hit this here. Oops, where shit. it connects, where it connects to the body. Yeah, where it connects to the body. So over here, I can actually go, you can see this one I can run all the way across and if those legs are pulled up like I don't actually run into the legs there's not an overlap um, in the in the body connection it, it goes you can draw one straight line without bumping into stuff do you want me to uh, you want me to pick up yeah, if you want to. Um, so we did a defaga. So now everything else pretty much is going to fall into polyphaga. So like we were saying, you can run all the way across. This is that the split between the first and second abdominal segments. So the first one is here. Uh, this is the second. But you can run all the way across that body without running into the legs. So this is the that coxa. This is where they connect to the body. Um, and it's not overlapping that division between the first and uh, second abdominal segment. So this is where your split is going to be uh, when you're going through that key. Uh, so we get into some of my favorite beetles. Um, the, these are some of your great big chunky dudes um, and some of the really, really fun ones. Um, we'll, we'll start with the scarabs. Uh, these guys are going to be super diverse. Um, they have clubbed antennae with, uh, that are lamellate at the tip. So you can see on, on this image here, you can see this little beetle has, has those antennae fanned out. Um, if, you're, if you've caught a grapevine beetle, those are really clear to see. They're really nice. Um, but a lot of those other big scarabs, you can see those really clearly and they're, they handle really well. Um, they also have uh, the front tibia are enlarged and toothed, so they've got little teeth on those tip on the sides of the tibia. And most of these guys are kind of chunky. Uh, they're kind of roundish. Um, we all know what, what May and June beetles look like. Um, and so they all kind of have that same body shape. Um, and then the scarabs are also going to include all of the dung beetles. Um, so this, uh, this one is a rainbow dung beetle. Uh, these are my favorite beetles in Kansas. Um, I am yet to see one alive. If anyone has one and would like to send it to me, please let me know. I will gladly take it off of your hands. Um, but these guys, super pretty, iridescent. They actually, they are dung beetles, so they do roll up the little balls of dung and we'll roll them across the, the field or the yard or the street. Um, but really wide range in, in sizing of these guys too. They can range from 1.5 to 160 millimeters. So some of the biggest beetles in the world are all going to be scarabs. They're uh, things like the Goliath beetle, uh, super chunky guys, uh, but really, really pretty awesome. Um, our next group is the Lucanids, uh, Lucan family Lucanidae. These are the stag beetles. Um, Jackie mentioned that ground beetle that had the, the big mandibles. Um, and this is, this is where they get confused a lot is because the, the stag beetles, the males in particular, are known for these great big mandibles. Um, they're not actually used for feeding. Those are used for, for mating um, and for fighting off other competitors in both uh, territories as well as for females. Uh, but so this one's the male. And then next to him, you can see here the female. She also has really big mandibles. Those are really easy to see. Um, 
And so it's really, these guys are known for those, those great big uh, mouth parts. Um, their antennae are lamellate. So you can see on the ends here, they do have those little fans and they're also geniculated. So that means they have this nice elbow in them, uh, like what we would see in ants. So you see that nice elbowed bend right there. Um, and then that first antenna mirror, which is this first segment here, is actually longer than the next five. So that is another one of those big key characteristics that you're going to look at um, through uh, the um, through the Lucanids. Um, and again, a pretty big range on these guys, uh, anywhere from eight to sixty millimeters. Uh, so some of them are pretty good sized, some of them are, are pretty tiny. Uh, but again, you're going to be looking. Primarily, you know, one of your big key features is uh, looking at these pretty big mandibles. Um, and yeah, George, you're right. Her, her mandibles are kind of small, but in comparison to, say, uh, the scarabs, where they're actually super tiny, these, these are enormous, um, especially on, on the females, because a lot of those mouth parts are generally kind of tucked under um, and not really readily visible, uh, whereas these are pretty pronounced. Um, and then we get into a couple of other uh, beetle or scarab relatives, the geotrupids. Um, and these guys, uh, they have those lamellated antennae again. They are, they do have 11 antenna mirrors. Um, and again, little round guys, um, pretty spherical um, and pretty good size range, uh, five to 45 millimeters. To me, they're not super common. Um, they are, uh, I don't think I've caught one, but it's entirely possible. Uh, but these guys and the Okidids, uh actually get confused for standard scarabs a lot. So uh, things that we're looking at there. Uh, with the Okidids, uh, these guys are going to have these prominent mandibles. So again, these are sticking out pretty far. Um, and then on the Okidids, you have that middle leg tibia. Uh, so this middle leg here and off the tibia, you actually have these great big spurs. You can see them uh, here where I'm kind of tracing over them. Um, and one edge of that, if you're looking at it under, under a scope, uh, it's actually serrated like a knife. Uh, but again, uh, globular body. So these guys are little, little round dudes, um, but have a lot of characteristics that get shared with uh, the scarabs. Um, hey, hey, Matt, can I add something to that? Sure, sure thing. Okay, so both of these two families, the Geotropidae and the Otodeidae, um, those are both most common out in the western end of the state. Um, I saw somebody on here was from Morton County. Uh, that's prime habitat for both of them. Um, uh, they're actually both fairly common out there. I learned something new today. Oh, um, one more thing. There's also a uh, subspecies of beetle that is apparently endemic to Kansas in the Geotrupidae. Um, I have to look at the exact name of it, um, but uh, uh, here, it, you, anybody can actually see that. Looks about like this. You'll have to share your screen, Isaac. Is it not working on the video? Oh, did you just hold it up? Yeah. Yeah. Well, no, gotcha. Yeah. Sorry. Let's see what I can I, do. I, I, but I, it's it's a really cool little beetle. Um. Yeah. So then we've got a couple other uh, kind of small beetles. We have the uh, Hibosaurids. Uh, these guys have cupped lamellate antennae. Um, again, little globular bodies, uh, kind of small guys. They're, they're less than a centimeter long. Um, and I freely admit the fact that I do not know a lot about them. Isaac, would you like to take this on? Yeah, <laughs> it's like I think you know more about these guys than we do. Okay, so the the Habasauridae, 
Um, most of them you're going to find in Kansas are going to be fairly small uh, ones. They, uh, they live on rotting fungi on the sides of trees. Uh, uh, and when disturbed, they'll kind of roll into an almost perfect ball. The uh, hind tibia on them are typically uh, pretty expanded. They're uh, fairly wide hind, hind tibia, at least for the ones in Kansas. Um, as for the cupped antenna, uh, so that basically means the, uh, the first antenna segment of that club uh, actually covers all the others. The others all fit down inside it. question about um, the beetle on the previous slide. I am not even going to attempt to try to pronounce it. He's wondering what type of habitat in western Kansas would you look for them in? Oh, um, so you want to look for both of those in uh, fairly sandy, arid habitats. Um, the Otodeide, uh, especially like canyons, um, and you're more likely to find them in sand than anything else. Uh, if you put out a light at night, you will probably get quite a few to come into it. I would suggest putting it out in August. Mid-August is usually the best time for it. Uh, any other questions so far? Um, so the heteroceridae are actually one of my favorite little beetles. Um, and I mean, like little beetles, they're like little teeny tiny dudes. Um, these guys are the variegated mud loving beetles. Um, and I have personally found these um, in Manhattan, out on the Kansas River, in the sandbars. They're out there, they've burrowed in. Um, and I found them purely by accident because if you've ever been on a sandbar out in a river, you know, you kind of sink into it a little bit. And I pulled my foot up and was popping these beetles out of um, their burrows, which are actually in the sandbars out in the middle of the river. And they were just popping up and then scurrying around and digging themselves back down uh, into the sand. Um, they have these really specialized front legs uh, that are used for digging. Um, and look really, really cool under a scope. But these guys, again, are, are a little bitty, um, but a really fun little beetle. They are, uh, they're pretty flat um, to get in and, and through the, the sandy soils real easy. Uh, they do have protruding mandibles, which you can kind of see here. They stick out a little bit. You can see it better um, on this image. Um, and then their big defining characteristic is these, these big you know, rake-like legs. Um, that's one of the, the big things you're looking at with, with those guys. Um, Allison, we can, we can talk a little bit about traps. I mentioned a lot of different kinds of traps in the, um, in the handout. But yeah, if we, we can go over different kinds of traps um, kind of towards the end, if, if that works for, for everybody. Uh, so then our next group are the, the trogids. I should have alphabetized this thing. Um, the trogids are the hide beetles. Um, these guys have, again, those lamellate antennae. Um, and so you can see them kind of kind of fanned out there a little bit. Uh, these guys are really rough in, in texture. So you can see on the elytra, uh, they've got like these little spikies. Um, so they're really roughly sculpted. They're often covered with a crust of soil because these guys do burrow into, um, into the ground um, around aged carcasses. So if you see something dead, you know it's been there for a while. If you flip it over um, and get underneath there, you may actually see where they have burrowed uh, some loose dirt up underneath that carcass. Um, so you can dig them up out of, out of their burrows and get them out that way. Um, 
And you can kind of see here, they're one of their other characteristics, their pronotums are kind of, kind of squarish um, and usually wider than they are long. Um, and then we have the hysterids. Uh, these are the, the clown beetles. And with the hysterids, they're, they're usually pretty small, um, you know, up to 20 millimeters, so about two centimeters. So not huge, but still can be fairly decent sized. Um, but they have, their heads are usually pretty concealed. You can see on these guys down here, their, their heads actually stick out from underneath the body but most of it is covered up underneath that pronotum. So their heads just kind of, their mouths kind of stick out. Um, but a lot of them do keep those heads concealed. Uh, they're kind of flat or they're oval shaped. Um, they're not like super chunky boys. Um, and then their elytra are kind of short. So the, the last couple of abdominal segments, you can see them from looking at them up above. Um, and then the elytra usually have striations on them. So they've got those lines uh, built into the elytra. Okay, then we have Leodidae, and that is the round fungus beetles. And um, so obviously, as you can tell in the name, you'll find them near budding fungi. And they're oval in shape. They have a very small eighth antennomere. So you, so when you count antenna, this is very important to note, you start from the base of the head and that would, the first segment you see will be one. And then going out, it'll be two, three, four, five, six. Oops, sorry. <laughs> and uh, the small one right there that Matt is circling, that is antennomere eight. And so that antenomere is very, very small compared to the rest of the antenomeres um, that are beside either one of it. And sometimes this is hard to tell um, unless you have that um, hand loop at least. Um, I have also found taking a picture if it's out uh, with your phone and then zooming it in can also help you if you're in the field. Um, that can help you quick identify to put it in a different uh, bag. Most people have cell phones on them now, so that's a, a quick trick cheat in order to help you identify things in the field um, to get a closer look. And these guys are really macro, small. Macro lenses are great for things like that. If you've got a clip-on macro lens, you can put it over your camera. Uh, you can get some really good, uh, nice zoomed-in quality photos uh, of these super tiny little guys that'll help you out a lot too. Yeah, they're available on Amazon for less than $10. So um, if you guys are into insect photography or if that's uh, something else you like to do, that's something to maybe think about investing in eventually or asking for your birthday or Christmas or something. Um, also, if you know anybody who's doing the, the photo books, Vicki, um, those are really good for, for that because you can get some, you know, you've got these little bitty guys that a lot of people would just see, oh, it's a little brown spot, looks like a little grain of rice. Um, you can get a, a decent picture of one of those uh, to actually use for notebooks if you're, if you're doing those. Yeah, so these guys are gonna be less than 10 millimeters long, so they're very small. Um, Nosodendridae, these are typically the wounded tree beetles. Um, there are only two species in Kansas from what I could find. Um, and I'm not sure if that goes all the way up to Southeast, uh, like US. Uh, I did not get to uh, get that information, but they're very small and um, they're little black beetles, unfortunately. They have capitulate antenna. So that means they have that little club right there at the end. They're less than 15 millimeters long and you will find these on trees that are um, typically uh, been struck or um, have some kind of wound, sometimes near fungus bodies as well. I've uh, found some uh, normally on older trees uh, that have those fungus bodies out to the side um, that are rotting away. That's where I found them. Um, Isaac, where have you found them? Um, I have found them on sap flows on the sides of trees mostly, uh, especially, especially like elm and hackberry. 
awesome. Um, and then we have Natilidae, and these are sap beetles. Again, uh, you'll find these near sap flows. Their head is not concealed, as you can see, it's completely out. And their body plan, as you can see from the example, it's pretty variable. It's got the tortoise shell, it's a kind of elliptical, rounded. Um, it kind of varies, but their elytra will show between one and three abdominal segments from that top view. And they have no striations on the elytra, so it will be smooth. Um, it may have hair, it might be a little cetaceous, but it will not have um, grooves in that elytra. And they're going to be 0 0.9 to 15 millimeters long. And some of these guys are really um, cute, in my opinion. And then <laughs> we have Tinidae. These are called the death watch beetles. And this is because they do a knocking sound um, in the wood. And so you will find these in um, damaged uh, trees and wooded areas. They're honestly not really defined easily. A lot of um, them do look kind of spiders, spider-like. That's why they're sometimes also called the spider beetles. Um, but not all of them fit that form. Um, cigarette beetles, oh wait, I'm sorry, that's Anobia day. Um, that was old. Uh, they do have a variable body plan and they do have variable antennae. So you'll see uh, manila form, um, you'll see filiform. And they're usually one to nine millimeters long, but usually there'll be less than five millimeters. Um, so they're quite small. Um, I've never personally caught them in the wild. And they're super cute too. Uh, spider beetles are adorable. They, they look like these little shiny, tiny spiders and they're like cute as can be. They're absolutely adorable. Okay, so next we have Erotilidae. Erotilidae are the pleasing fungus beetles, and it was one of my favorite finds for my taxonomy class um, that I found, and I found, I found them multiple times since then, um, but they are usually on uh, fungus bodies, and typically they're going to be on the shelf fungus on trees. They're going to be elongate and oval um, shaped, and they have uh, procoxal cavities that are closed. So on their first um, leg segments on the ventral side, those coxa, instead of being open and uh, side to side, it will be completely closed, enclosed on both sides by their, um, I keep forgetting what this is called. It's uh, the body, like not their membrane, their, um, Abdomen. It's not on the abdomen. This is going to be the first leg. Um, I can't I'll, tell you. I don't know what word you're going for. But it's uh, they're only two to twenty-two millimeters long. Um, their exoskeleton will like enclose it. Um, so then we have Tetratomidae. And these are the polypore fungus beetles. You'll also find these on budding fungus. Um, I've also found these on uh, shelf fungus in uh, wooded areas. I normally find them, especially after it's rained and it's quite um, moist outside. And so they have a tarsal formula of 554 and their tarsi are not lobed underneath. So, um, Typically, they uh, have a, there will be some beetles that have a lobe that um, encloses their tarsi on each segment or just on one segment, and that can be a distinct factor, but this is not the case for Tetratomidae, and this will be important when we continue on because there are a family that looks very similar to this that we'll discuss, um, and they're between two and seven millimeters long. Oh, uh, Isaac, do you want to do? Jackie, do you want to keep going? Do you want me to take over? Whoever. Uh, uh, I guess I can do it. Let's see if I can remember how to pronounce the scientific or the actual name for it. 
Cosinellidae, uh, lady beetles. <laughs> They're going to be more round, elliptical, kind of dome shaped, convex bodies. Um, typically very shiny. Uh, sometimes they'll be covered in hairs or scales. Um, most of them are going to be brightly colored, orange, yellow, black, red, any combination of those. Tarsi uh, formula would be 444. Four, four. And they are typically between 0.8 and 18 millimeters long. So uh, pretty small, typically. Um, do you want me to keep going on to the next? You, if you want to keep going, you keep going. OK. I'll let you talk as long as you want. The Chrysomelody. These are the leaf beetles. Um, commonly, they're, yeah, they're commonly a pest on ornamental plants. Um, they're going to be oval, dome-shaped. Uh, some of them can be confused with lady beetles, uh, such as the tortoise beetles. They're on the, uh, yeah, right there on the top left-hand corner. Um, so they can be confused with lady beetles. But they have a tarsi formula of 555 five, five instead of the 444. Four, four. And the uh, antenna are typically just a little bit different. If I remember right, uh, Christ Melody always have filiform, uh, uh, if I remember right, or typically. Um, lady beetles. Typically, if I remember right, <laughs> which I'm not sure I do, um, if I remember right, they have more of a clubbed antenna. Um, well, so chrysomelids are actually, I, I kind of set you up on this one, and I should apologize for that. Um, chrysomelids, if you're ever walking yourself through a key, uh, generally, you get to a place where, like, the coccinellids, so the lady beetles, are going to come out in one spot. Um, chrysomelids are a massively diverse group. They're actually really hard to, to key out as a collective group. So if you're going through a taxonomic key and you're actually working through it, um, chrysomelids are going to come out in about 10 to 15 different places a lot of times because there's a lot of different variability. You get like these tortoise shell beetles who kind of look like, like lady beetles. Um, you get this guy who kind of sort of looks like he might be a scarab. You get this guy who kind of looks like a, um, a net winged beetle. Um, you get this guy who looks completely different. There, there's not any really good way to describe chrysomelids, except if it if you know what it isn't, it might be a chrysomelid. <laughs> so I, I kind of set you up on that one and I, I apologize, Isaac, I didn't think about that. It's also important to note that the Tarsi formula on coccinellid, um, even though it's 444, four, it might look like 333. Three, three. They're very hard and very small to count. So um, don't be afraid if you only count three, three, three. Oh. Okay, the Lampyridae, Lampyridae, sorry. Um, so these ones, the pronotum is typically going to be kind of D-shaped. Uh, it's going to cover the head, except for occasionally you'll have uh, if you're looking at a live one, you'll have an especially energetic live one that's sticking its uh, head out on beyond the pronotum, uh, which can look confusing, but the easiest way to tell them from most other, or from all other uh, families, is to look at the underside, uh, at the tip of the abdomen, where they have a, uh, I suppose you call it a glow organ, I can't remember what it's called, but uh, and that is, it's present on most, but not all. Actually, the brown one over there with the, uh, uh, there on the left-hand side, it actually, I recognize that one, it actually does not have much of a 
uh, light on the bottom. Um, they, uh, but as you can see, the uh, pronotum does cover the head on it. Uh, and they are between four and 18 millimeters. So fairly small beetles. Um, you can find them, especially right now, uh, right after sunset, uh, you'll see them flashing, uh, especially near trees. Uh, the ones you see right now are, yeah, okay. <laughs> Sorry, rabbit trail. Anyways, uh, so the next group is cantharidae. Uh, so the pronotum does not cover the head. Uh, that's, they're uh, sometimes mistaken for a lampyridae or firefly, uh, but as you can see, the pronotum does not cover the head. The fourth tarsal segment is lobed. Uh, one second. There we go. They do not have any luminescence. Um, now that this is important because there are some that match the color scheme of a lampyridae. Um, yeah, and they're between five and 15 millimeters. Um, I'm going to add, once you have pinned these guys, um, the reason that we, we bring out a point that the pronotum does or does not cover the head um, if you look at the, the firefly, you can see on this underside, you can see the pronotum actually comes all the way up over the head uh, like a hood. Whereas on the, the cantharnids, on the soldier beetles, um, it stops well behind the head. But once these guys are dead, their heads tend to, they droop. And it looks like the head, it actually, their neck kind of hinges like right here. Uh, so it looks a lot like their head is hidden underneath the pronotum. Uh, so these two families will get confused a lot if you're not looking at um, other things uh, or aren't familiar with with kind of what you're looking at because once that head droops um, these guys can look a lot like the fireflies all right so we have um the family melodidae this is the blister beetles um it's important uh, to not really handle them too much. If you can identify them in the field, they can um, produce a compound that is very irritating to uh, us. So maybe try to not handle them if you can. It's best to capture them in a jar um, or in your net and then place them in a kill jar uh, before or freeze before um, handling them. They have a tarsal formula of 554. Um, we don't see this very common in beetles, and so this is why it's important to note. They have filiform or maniliform antennae, and their prothorax um, is gonna be much more narrow than the elytra. So um, you'll see it typically the head and then a thin thorax and then the elytra, um, and that will be much wider. The tarsal claws are also clefted. This is not easily seen though, unless you have a larger specimen or if you have um, that loop or um, the phone trick like we discussed earlier or a microscope, something of that nature. Um, and they're three to 70 millimeters long and um, they can be really cool. Now we have Odomeridae and Odomeridae uh, also has that 554 segment uh, of those tarsal segments. These, however, are false blister beetles. And um, we can typically tell because uh, their filiform antennae will be 11 segments long. Um, typically, that's not seen in Meloidae, but they also sometimes have different um, antennal forms, which is serrate or clavate. So if you get on that filiform and you're stuck, just look to that prothorax. Um, it's going to be without margins and it's expanded anteriorly so towards the head it'll be much larger instead of being um, narrow um, right behind the head and then they also um, 
have rounded sides, but you can sometimes see that in some of the Meloids as well. So just look for those features if you do not have a key. Um, but like Matt and I have already said, if you can get a key and get your hands on a key, it's always good to run that through a key if you're not quite sure right from sight. Um, five to 20 millimeters long, they're gonna be. And um, I found them uh, both Meloidae and Odomeridae in the very similar habitats. Uh, so just be aware of that. Then we have uh, some of my favorite beetles, Clarity. And these are called the checkered beetles. Um, also one of my favorites, uh, the red-legged ham beetles in this group. They have clubbed antennae and their pronotum will be more narrow than their elytra. Their body is very setose. And most of them will have a checkered pattern on the elytra or on the body. Um, that's why they got their name, the checkered beetles. And they're two to 24 millimeters long. Um, then we also have Malaridae. And Malaridae are also known as the soft wing flower beetle. They have seri antennae. Um, their antenna is in front of their head, not um, by or behind the eyes. Uh, and so this is um, important. Some of them have a very distinct antennomere, as you can see on the one. However, that's not throughout the whole family. They do have prominent coxae, though, uh, especially on the hind legs, uh, as you can see um, from the one standing with the really funny antenna. Um, it's quite large and uh, prominent, and they're only two to seven millimeters long, so they're quite small. Then we have Anthicidae. These are the ant-like uh, beetles. They have a body that's resembling, of course, ants, and they typically have an ant coloration. They have very prominent femurs, um, so they're much wider and thicker when you compare them to other beetles that may look like them. You can see it more distinctly in the image that has several of them next to each other. Um, they also have very large eyes, and this is to help them mimic um, ants. And sometimes they live uh, in ant colonies as well, or they scavenge off from ant colonies, and that's why they mimic them to um, be able to do that. And they're between two and 12 millimeters long. Um, I've never seen these in Kansas, but I'm sure they're here somewhere. Probably more in the West, uh, but I'm not sure. Then we have Elmidae. Um, Elmidae are another aquatic uh, beetle. And these are called the riffle beetles. And they're riffle beetles because in fast moving streams of water where the water's kind of bubbling, that's called a riffle. And so these guys have long legs with very long tarsal claws in order to hold on to those rocks um, in those fast moving waters. I've only ever found these in fast moving waters in those riffle areas. And they're quite small, they're lower, they're less than four millimeters long. Um, but when you catch one, it's uh, they're really cool to get. All right, then we have Mordelidae. Mordelidae is uh, it's got a, for, a tarsal formula of five five four. These are called the tumbling flower beetles. They have very simple antennae, um, typically maniliform, um, sometimes filiform. And they have a web wedge-shaped body with a humped back. So you can see in the image where it's the orange and black. It's very humped-like. Um, they're very cute if you can uh, catch them. You're going to want to point these guys um, unless you find a large one. And their abdomen will come to that point. And they're small, of course, only 1.5 to 15 millimeters long. Um, I'm, I've only ever been able to point these guys. I've never gotten one I can put on a pin. Um, I have seen one pinnable mm -hmm. specimen, one individual. Um, I've always had to point mine too. Uh, then we have Ripophority, and they also have that tarsal uh, formula 554. However, they have flabellate antennae, so you can see it's very fan-like. They also share that wedge-shaped body. 
However, their elytra is much softer and it doesn't as well come all the way to the tip of uh, the abdomen. The abdomen does come to a point. Um, however, these guys, um, the ones that I found are much more fragile. So um, you will also find these guys on uh, flowers. That's where I found mine. Um, I found them mostly in late August but uh, I found mine on milkweed. Um, I'm not sure where others have found them. And they are commonly just called riphophorid beetles, so. All right. Um, so I'll pick up here. Uh, the the riphocerids, um, I actually saw my first one of these this year, uh, this last year. Um, I was teaching the taxonomy class or um, general entomology class um, at K-State and these guys, the, the riphocerids, are the cicada parasites um, and are actually really, really cool. We, um, the professor who I was teaching with um, hadn't seen one in a couple of years and we had eight turned in this last fall. Um, and since we have the big broods of uh, cicadas coming up, I expect these to be really common this year. Um, their antennae are really clearly uh, flabellate, so you can see those spread out really nicely. Um, they also have a uh, nose-like projection between the mandibles, uh, which you can't really see in any of these. Um, but uh, their, their big main feature is you know, these fan-shaped antennae, um, they're kind of long. They look like a, a long scarab beetle. Um, and with looking at uh, their tarsi, they're actually uh, kind of heart-shaped. Like we couldn't find a good picture of them, uh, but they also have pads. And that body shape, those antennae, and looking at the, the tarsi, uh, you're actually not gonna be able to mix these guys up with, with much else. Uh, they're they're pretty distinct. Um, and then we have the the fingotids. Uh, these are the glowworm beetles. Um, so these guys uh, are the kind of the one exception to having um, those uh, plumose antennae, um, as you can see here. Um, that is pretty much found only in Lepidoptera, but these guys are are that big exception for us. Um, they do bioluminesce um, as larvae, which is how they got the, the name glowworms. Um, they've got short, soft elytra, um, and they, uh, they're they often kind of long. You can see here, they're kind of long. They're pretty flat as well as adults. Uh, but if you get one as a, as a juvenile, they're definitely going to kind of glow really brightly. There's some really good pictures of those online. Um, that we didn't include. Um, and then we have uh, the Lyceids. These are the, the net winged beetles. Uh, these guys have, again, super soft elytra. Uh, it's kind of characteristic of a bunch of these, uh, these groups. Um, and you can see their antennae are very serrated. Uh, they, so they've got the serrate antennae. They, they look like they're really jagged. Um, and then their elytra are often patterned as well. So you can see all the, the ribbing, the textures in, in those elytra. Um, these guys are really pretty common. Uh, you can find them a lot uh, just in flowers or various vegetation if you are sweeping. Um, it should be pretty common right now if you're out looking for them. Um, our next group, I love these guys, the Cerambicids. Uh, these are the longhorn beetles. Um, with all of these guys, their antennae are going to be at least as long as half of their body length, but often they're going to be a lot longer. If you've seen a, a nice, good longhorn, you've seen you know, they have these antennae that go way past their butts. Uh, sometimes, you know, significantly, they're like two or three times as long as the body. Um, their antennae actually come out of a raised shelf, which is right here um, in the eye. And with that eye, it's also notched. It actually circles around the antennae, uh, which is a characteristic that's pretty unique to these guys. 
Um, they are pretty good sized. And uh, this is the, the cottonwood borer. Um, I have seen them fly. They're really slow, like helicopter drone flyers. They just kind of putter along. Um, and if you catch and grab a, a good sized serambicid, they also squeak, uh, which is kind of fun. But they're, they're really easy to identify because of those uh, super long antennae. And then if you look at those eyes again, uh, those two things combined are going to take you right into being a longhorn. Um, these next couple of families, uh, I know we're getting late, so I will pick up a little bit. Uh, Buprestids, uh, these are the, uh, the jewel beetles. Um, this includes the emerald ash borer, so I'm sure a lot of you guys are familiar with that. Um, it is an invasive pest that was introduced um, and is becoming a, a pest of great concern um, in Kansas. I know we've done some stuff with it on campus. Uh, these guys often have bullet-shaped bodies, so they're, they're very elongate um, and kind of rounded. Uh, oftentimes they're metallic, but it's not always a thing. Um, and then when you look at them underneath, the first two abdominal segments are fused. Um, and these guys can be really, really gorgeous. Um, a lot of people raise them um, in their homes to use the elytra coverings for, uh, for jewelry. Uh, because they are just really gorgeous. They're, like I said, they're often metallic, um, but not always the case. Uh, the elaterids, uh, these guys are our click beetles. Um, I'm sure we've all seen a click beetle. Um, you know how much fun it is to flip one over and watch it flick, uh, flip itself upright uh, by, by clicking its head. Um, the key features you're going to look for here um, is going to actually be these, these corner spines on the uh, pronotum. That's actually what they're locking into to make that click. Um, also their antennae are serrated. Um, and then if you uh, flip them over, they do have a spine, a prosternal spine uh, that we're looking at there as well. Um, the bostrichids. Uh, these guys, um, I like to think of them as little monks. If you've ever taken a good look at a bostrichid, uh, their heads are kind of tucked under. So this is actually the pronotum here and their head is completely underneath this and kind of faces downward. Uh, so it is a hood-like pronotum, oftentimes has spines. Um, the antennae are clubbed, as you can see here. Um, and a lot of these guys are pests in stored grains. I actually did a lot of my undergrad research um, using them and they're one of my least favorite beetles that exists because they don't do what you want them to do ever. Um, our dermestids, um, these guys, uh, if you have an insect collection that has ever gotten eaten, it was most likely by dermestid beetles. Uh, these guys will eat anything organic that isn't bone. So they'll eat other insects, they'll eat flesh, they'll eat um, literally anything organic. Um, any natural history museum that has bones out on display keeps colonies of dermestids. Um, they'll, you know, you take them an animal, they'll toss it into their dermestid colony, and then they just take out the bones uh, to display because these guys are that efficient. Um, they will eat, uh, this is a, a carpet beetle. Uh, these guys actually live in a lot of houses, um, anywhere that you have pets in particular. Um, they'll eat pet food, they'll eat uh, dead skin cells and hair, um, and their bodies are actually covered in these super fine hairy scales. Uh, so they're very, very cetose and look really neat underneath a scope um, and can be really, really tiny. I click. Do you want to do Tenebrionids, Jackie? Yeah, so uh, next we have Tenebrionidae, and um, these guys are actually quite common. They have maniliform or clavate uh, antenna, and this comes out from underneath a shelf. So if you look, there is a little shelf, and right underneath there's an antenna that comes out. Um, Matt, I don't know if you can point that out on that right image here. for me. Thank you. 
Uh, their body can be very variable in shape um, and they can be really small to quite large. And this is where we find our red flower beetles. So if you've ever had little bugs in your flower, this could be one of them. Um, we also have Pasalidae. These are called best beetles or, um, I forget what else they're called, but they make a really cool squeaking noise um, in the wood and they actually communicate to one another. And their main feature is on their pronotum, so on that thorax on the top view, there's gonna be a groove. And their antenna are not gonna be elbowed. They're not genticulate. So don't confuse these guys for uh, those stag beetles, okay? And this is especially because that first antennomere is going to be shorter than the next four. So that's another characteristic. So both of those characteristics will help you determine that this is not that stag beetle. And they're 30 to 40 millimeters long, and you're going to find these in rotting wood. Then we have uh, sylphidae. Um, they're known as carrion beetles. Um, a good way that I found to find these guys is go find some roadkill and flip it over. I know that sounds really gross and it's gonna stink and it stinks to high heaven, but that's how you can get these guys. Um, I put a drop uh, trap near some roadkill. Uh, just put it in the ground next to the roadkill and that's how I caught some of those with some dish soap. Um, their elytra are going to be soft. They have antenna with about 11 segments and they're going to be clubbed at the end. And they have two main forms. You'll see um, like a wide round form. Um, these are typically called, uh, I think they're called carrion beetles and the others called burying beetles, but I could be wrong. You're, um, you're correct. Yeah, okay, so this is a carrion beetle. They're typically rounder, and then you have the longer form that looks a lot like that American burying beetle. These are also called burying beetles. But as you can see on this, these pronotum do not have any of the red, and the antenna on the tips do not have any red. So you, these are safe to collect. Then we have our staphies, staphylinidae. These guys are actually really cool. They're called rogue beetles. And I think these guys are just amazing. They have wings that come out from under these very, very short elytra. And they're actually great flyers, surprisingly enough. Um, they do come to night, but you also can find them roaming around in um, sandy soils. You also can find them in dung. Um, their elytra are shortened with enough to have uh, at least three to six segments. And so, uh, showing from that top view. Um, and they can be very small to quite long. And you typically can see the mandibles on these guys, um, just so you know. All right. We're almost getting there, guys, I promise. Um, we have Pisandridae, Pisandridae, uh, depending on how you want to call them. They're the parasitic flat bark beetles. They um, have unequal tibial spurs on their front legs. So it's kind of hard to see considering this uh, image is not that great. Um, but if you have a larger specimen that's um, in that 30 millimeter length, you will see these guys. They're very flattened and compressed. And this is because they get right up underneath that bark. They do have grooves on their head. And this is distinct uh, for the species that you're looking at. You guys do not have to go down to species, which is awesome. Um, but they will have those mandibles sticking out. So if you see a really flattened beetle with these long uh, antennae and they have grooves on their head, it's most likely Pisandridae if you can't see those tibia. Then we have Trogosity. And they, as you can see, uh, are uh, they have a wider pronotum than their head. Their mandibles are also prominent. They do have that elongate body, um, but they are going to be found around carrion. They are a type of hide beetle, so you will see them um, near those uh, carrion. Okay, 
Next, we have monotomidae. These are root-eating beetles. I have never collected these. Um, they are elongated and they are parallel sided. So if you look from one side to the other, they're very parallel. Um, they have 10 segments on their antenna and the last two, only the last uh, one to two will form that club. So it's a very, very short club. Um, and they're gonna be very small, about one to one and a half to six millimeters long. Now we have Kujidae, or Kujidae, depending on how you want to say it. Um, these guys, I've only ever seen them in stored products. Um, however, I'm sure they can be collected in the wild. Um, they're flattened with an elongate body. They have five abdominal segments, which is actually um, kind of interesting because most uh, beetles have more than five. And they're flat bark beetles, so again, that's why they're flattened. You can see, you can find them underneath flattened bark. And they're going to be between 6 and 25 millimeters long. All right, we're coming in at the end, you guys. <laughs> it's I'm a lot. We know it's a lot. We're sorry. <laughs> All right, we have Koopa Dide, and these are reticulated beetles. They have reticulated elytra, and these reticulated means it's like a window, okay? So they're going to be raised and kind of window-like, have different little squares on that elytra. And they have, um, again, an elongate parallel-sided body, and they have broad scale CD. So they're kind of hairy, but it looks almost like um, the butterfly wings CD or scales on their wings. So it's uh, very broad and they're only 10 to 20 millimeters long. And then we have one of the most diverse groups in all of the beetles, Curculionidae. These are the true weevils. They have a long snout with very small mouth parts right at the end. They have those elbow geniculate antenna and the antenna are gonna rise from up underneath those eyes. So it's kind of hard to tell because this uh, acorn weevil's uh, antenna are kind of rising. They rise up underneath the eyes, but it almost looks like it's rising up out from that rostrum or the snout, but it's actually connecting right underneath those eyes. They're going to be between one and 40 millimeters long. And you guys can actually find these um, pretty commonly, especially the acorn weevil. You find those around oak trees in the mid to late summer, and I have seen those guys come to light at night. Mm -hmm. There's also, you can get them out of sunflowers and... Uh, they're you, everywhere. They're everywhere. They're the most diverse group of beetles out there. So, um, yeah. Look for those elbowed antenna for sure. All right. Then we have Anthrob Anthrobiidae. Anthrobiidae are the uh, fungus weevils. So they have a short flat snout and their antenna are clubbed, but they will never be elbowed. So they will never have that distinct elbow of the typical true weevil um, characteristic. And these guys are 0.4 to 16 millimeters long. Um, here's a good image of those, how those antennae come out from underneath the eyes. Yeah. yeah. Last but not least, for sure, we have Brentidae. And Brentidae, um, they have a very straight snout. They are typically called the straight snout or pear shaped weevil. And their first two abdominal segments are going to be a lot longer than the rest of their abdominal segments. They're also elongate um, and narrow and kind of cylindrical. Um, the one on the right is the sweet potato weevil. That's actually a huge pest in sweet potatoes. So if you guys grow sweet potatoes, you might be able to find them in your garden. And they're two to not 80 millimeters long. So that is the last of our 53 families we covered tonight. And you guys are absolute troopers. Um, yeah, absolutely. One thing I'm going to point out real quick, the, so the Brentids, 
Um, you can see here on this guy, you can see how straight that snout is. Whereas if we go back, you can see this one's really curved, a lot like Gonzo from the, uh, the Muppets. Uh, so this is that big defining characteristic between those two families. This one's, you know, these guys are pretty curved. They are downward facing and that one sticks more straight out. Good point, Matt. I do what I can. So, um, so with, you know, with all of that, again, that's 53 of the approximately 80 beetles in the ecosystem. Uh, we covered things that are on fungus, things that are stored product pests. They uh, deal with dung, they eat wood, they uh, decompose bodies, they're aquatic, they, they're pollinators. Beetles, there are so many beetles, they have taken over literally every single thing. You, if you can think of it, beetles probably do it. Uh, they're predators, they're pollinators, they're decomposers. They, they just do so many really cool things and they're, they're just so fascinating. This is, this is why I love beetles, because if you, if you can think of something that you think is cool, um, if you can think of a, you, you like a color, beetles probably exist in it. Um, and, you know, I, I, there's, they just do everything. They're, they're vital parts in, in our ecosystem. Um, the USDA does a ton of work with beetles uh, as stored product pests. Um, so like the, the red flower beetles that you can see here, I did the vast majority of my undergrad research um, with those guys. So um, beetles pretty much do everything. And if, like I said, if you, if you think, think about it, beetles probably do it. Uh, so questions, anything you guys want to talk about? I know we mentioned traps, we did so mention traps. maybe we can talk about that a little bit. Sure. Um, so uh, drop traps are easy to make. Uh, you can use just a red solo cup and use a little soapy water. Um, bury the cup into the ground till it's level uh, with the cup. Uh, basically put the cup into the ground to the cup rim um, and make sure it's well uh, secured. You may want to put a covering on it if it's going to be in an open sunny area and make sure you go and check your trap um, every, every day if not every few days and make sure that there's water still in it and to collect the insects from there so they do not discolor. Um, that's a really easy way to get some of the ground beetles and anything that kind of comes across, especially if you're near carry-on or in a garden, something like that. Um, traps for lights at night. I typically just get a black light from Walmart. That's what I have. It's uh, like a $20 light. Hold on. I got it. I'm Googling. I'm going quick. Um, so I just use a white sheet. I just plug it in, set it up outside, um, and use it. Uh, this is, this is super easy. I did this. Um, this is actually something I do with my nieces and nephew. Um, my parents live kind of out in the country, um, in my hometown and, um, I'll just, to run an extension cord from the house out into the backyard and just buy one of those bar uh, black lights and just set it on a sheet and just all sorts of stuff comes to it. It's, it's really an easy and inexpensive way to um, collect stuff at night. If you have a black, uh, if you have a porch light, you can switch your bulb out for a black light. Um, your neighbors might think you're weird, but it doesn't matter, especially if you have a white colored house or a light colored house. Uh, that's a good way to also collect them. <laughs> um, I have spent many nights on my front porch with my black light front porch and just collected insects off my house. So I have spent um, many nights on your front porch. <laughs> yeah, um, I would say uh, a use of a net. I do a lot of hand collecting with beetles though, um, because they're typically not going to harm you at all. Uh, I will say serambicids, I have been bit by those and those suckers can hurt. Yeah. Um, 
but a lot of times if you get them just right, they'll just squeak a lot. So it's nothing to be really afraid of. Um, so those are the main trapping systems I think I use. Um, what about uh, you, Isaac? Um, uh, did you talk about Malay's trap? No, I did not. Okay. So I actually use a malaise trap the most. Um, there, can, can everybody see on their screens? I'm uh, working on it. Give me a second. I'm going to share again. Uh, I wanna... Here we go. There we go. So I actually use a malaise trap for a lot of uh, my collecting, especially uh, right now. Um, uh, make sure you check it every day. <laughs> you don't want the beetles discoloring or anything. Um, and uh, usually they put a, uh, a Vapona strip. Um, I can't think of what uh, the other name for them is, but uh, put those down there in that lower cup. Uh, the way these work is they have uh, kind of walls on them. The insects fly along, they hit the barrier, and then most of them are going to fly up, except for most of the beetles, which will drop. Uh, but most of the insects will fly up and go end up into a upper jar. Then if you have everything right in the bottom jar, killing agent down there, they'll actually die up in the top jar and then fall down into the bottom one. And that's a good way to catch a lot of different, uh, a lot of different insects. Um, it also doesn't require a lot of effort. Um, malaise traps, they're very passive. Uh, so like Isaac said, you, you pretty much just set it up and let things come to it. Um, so you can see this one's set up out in a field. Um, but any, any insect that's flying across this will fly into that. And most of them do tend to go up. So they will climb up this and keep going up because they'll try to take off from a high point and then they get up here into a collection area. Um, will, they, will they fall into alcohol or something of that nature? Um, and they can get really complicated. This one's kind of like fan shaped. So it works in the exact same way, but from all four directions. Yeah. Um, next, if you want to pull up a Lindgren trap mat. Um, I know people have made their own Lindgren funnel traps. Um, this is used a lot for a lot of those bark beetles um, and some of the stored product beetles. You can put whatever food bait you want in the bottom of the trap and you um, just hang it up in a tree and they will fly into the trap and they funnel down into the food bait. So whatever that food bait is though, you want to make sure it doesn't get too wet um, mm -hmm. because especially if you don't check it frequently because the bait will rot or get nasty and then also your beetles can uh, die in there and start to rot. Um, it's just not very fun if you've ever um, got yourself in a situation where you have some really stinky stuff that can happen. I've, I've done this specifically with rotting ham to catch uh, different uh, clarids um, that specialize on rotting ham. So um, you can use though anything from flour or uh, fruits and vegetables. I've I've strawberry and uh, dog food. Um, um, it sounds a little odd, but actually beer or alcohol does put off a smell that uh, mimics rotting woods. Mm -hmm. um, and damage. So that would be something you would need your parents to assist you with, uh, definitely. Um, but that yeah, is another option. Is, um, you, if you guys are looking at the handout, um, I have molasses traps listed on there a lot. Um, that is something you could put in, in something like these. You'd want to put it into um, like a smaller container, like a disposable ramekin cup, um, so that your beetles aren't just sitting in molasses because that gets really gross and they're hard to clean and pin and and everything but you want to like molasses would be a really good thing to put in here 
um, or even in a pitfall trap. Mm -hmm. And if you're looking for instructions on how to build any of these, um, like you can, there's all sorts of like do it yourself stuff on how to, on how to make a lot of these traps yourself. So uh, solo cups is a really good way to do it. Um, with, I have the one with the panels, Matt. I can show that. You got it. I'll stop sharing. Yeah. So this is a paneled trap that does have a light in the middle and it goes down and then there's a collection unit at the bottom. So this is um, a night trap, but it also can be used just as a bait trap. Um, this is more industrial, but it can be made out of like wood um, with a bucket funnel. This is could be easily made um, depending on how uh, long or far you want to continue an entomology. That's an option. I think those are all the main ones, um, other than just using like a net or a beat stick um, or something of, oh, like catching by a drop hand. Card. Yeah, a drop cloth. I think those are, I think those are all the big ones. Show my screen really quickly. I want everybody to know where they can locate these. So this is um, our main Kansas 4-H website. Uh, if you kind of hover over project tab, select um, Ag and Natural Resources, you'll see the entomology project is the first one at the top of the list. Um, we have lots and lots of resources available. Um, covering all, all different aspects of the entomology project. We have links to the curriculum that we encourage you guys to use. Um, David had to hop off, but uh, if you attended Monday night's webinar, you saw some of the videos. Um, but I, you know, if you weren't able to, to hop on Monday, um, please go back. I think you'll find these videos really helpful. Uh, and then over here in the upper right-hand corner, we have a link um, to what is our, our normal event page where we post a lot of the event specifics, which obviously looks a little different this year since we're having them virtual. Um, but this is where the slides for both um, Monday and tonight's webinars are located. So here's the PowerPoint uh, slides in a PDF. And then there's also this additional Beetle handout uh, that they made um, for you as well. Um, you can go back if you if you weren't on Monday. You can go back and watch the recorded webinar, and then after tonight's, I'll get the link up to tonight's recording as well. So if you've got friends or 4-H buddies that are excited about entomology and weren't able to get on, or you want you think they would enjoy it, please feel free to to share this with them. Um, Allison, to uh, you mentioned water bug traps. There's not a real great um, trap for water beetles. A lot of them are like you need a uh, like an aquatic net, uh, which you can also use for um, like an aquarium net, but you can get like sturdier nets. Um, these guys, so the beetles at least are going to be more on the surface of the water or on vegetation along the edges um, or in the water. Um, and like the stuff on the vegeta vegetation, if you pull it out of the water, they'll actually leave it and try to go back. Uh, so you can just kind of pick them out that way. The I would say the hardest of the water beetles to catch would be the, the whirly gigs, the gerenids, um, because they see you coming a mile and a half away and they just kind of take off and scatter. Um, so they do crouch down, sneak up yeah. on them, and then only skim the surface of the water and bring it up motion. Yeah, yeah. I always go. I like using a long handled net and going underneath them and just popping up under them. Um, is is one of the things that I do. Um, and then finally, I think the last thing that we have for you um, is we have. I went from that slide. Here it is. Um, I'm not Some sure. Some additional resources. Yeah. Uh, 
but I'm not sharing my screen and I can't, there it is. Um, so we have here uh, just some additional resources for you. Um, so we've got the bug guide page uh, and these are linked in, in the, the PowerPoint. So don't try to write these down. Um, but you've got bug guide, um, you've got uh, the entomology department at the University of Florida. Um, you have entomology from K-State. Um, so we have guide to insect orders. Um, like I said, I have this Beetles of Eastern North America. This is by far my favorite of the beetle books. Um, and it is, I looked at it today, I said it was like 25 bucks. And I mean, this thing's, this thing's a book. Um, so it's a great resource. Um, and if you've got a, a macro lens and you've got a smartphone, um, you can take really pretty good pictures of stuff. Google Lens will usually get you close. It's not perfect. Don't, don't think that's the end all be all, um, but it will at least kind of get you in the ballpark. Um, it'll, it'll help you out there a little bit. So if you're really stuck on something, um, it'll, you know, take a picture of something if you haven't used it and it'll, get you there. It'll show you some options for things that might be, um, that usually get you, get you pretty close. And then always, if you have questions, um, I mean, my email is in the slides. Feel free to reach out. Let me know if you've got any questions. I'm happy to help you as best as I can. Um, it's Thank hard you. sometimes to do it like over the internet through Zoom or um, email or whatever, um, but I'll do what I can. But our family gives us plenty of photos that are barely identifiable, and typically we can get pretty close. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, if you get really stuck, um, I definitely think uh, Matt and I would be willing to help you out if you uh, get in contact with us with our email. Yeah. You can yes, contact me too if you want. <laughs> Yes, thank you, um, all three of you, Jacqueline, Matt, and Isaac, for presenting tonight. Let's everybody give them a round of applause. <laughs> yes, and while you know, while we wish we could be in person, um, this this has gone extremely well. I hope you have found them very helpful, um, and and all of the presenters this week have have offered their emails, and and they're all linked on on the slides. Um, for each evening. So please feel free to reach out to them or your local project leader if you have one in the entomology project. But if not, any of these folks um, would be happy to help you. As would I, I will just refer you on to someone who knows about insects. <laughs> He's really good with that forward email button. <laughs> I'm learning. I learned a bunch tonight. <laughs> um, so again, just another little plug for Friday's webinar, um, same place, same time. So this link for tonight is the same link for Friday. Um, and Friday's webinar will cover sort of our alternative exhibiting option. So if, if the collection box is not your thing and you're more interested in photos of insects or you wanna make a diorama or a display, We'll, we'll kind of walk you through what some of those uh, options look like and, and get you thinking along those lines. So it'll be a great one. Um, and I think with that, I will stop recording and we can all go about our evenings. But thank you again to tonight's presenters and, and thank you to all for being such engaged participants um, for almost two hours. So give yourself yeah. a pat on the back. Thank you guys so much. Yeah, thanks, thanks for sticking everybody. with us.